everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and this is a solo playthrough beginning right now with scene number one of ten scenes found inside Night of the Living Dead from Cool Mini or Not. If you haven't checked out my unboxing and setup video, I'll link to the entire showcase in the top right hand corner. You can go find those videos there to figure out how we got to where we're currently at right now. And without further ado, we're going to start talking about the narrative of why we're here and what's actually happening in this scene. Then we'll move into the win and loss conditions and also talk about any special rules we should be aware of in order to try to achieve a victory. So without further ado, let's find out a bit more about that narrative. Ben was attacked by an army of ghouls at Beekman's Diner and barely escaped inside a car. However, its tank is running empty. He manages to pull up onto a gas pump only to realize that it's locked. Staying calm, Ben notices a house nearby and decides to enter it, hoping to find the keys to the pump. Ben finds Barbara still in shock from all the horror befalling her. A nasty surprise awaits both of them on the second floor as the house's owner met a grisly doom. Not long after, Harry, Helen, Judy, and Tom burst from the basement and a short argument ensues over the best course of action to adopt. Everyone agrees, somewhat reluctantly, to barricade the house from the ghouls outside. With the narrative understood, we now need to get a better understanding of how we win the actual scene we're playing, and that's called the objectives. In this case, we have one major objective, but it has two conditions inside of it that have to be met simultaneously in order for us to win. The first one is we need to ensure that all indicated windows inside of the scenario book are blocked with closed barricades. And we'll talk about how the barricades work when we go through the special rules for this scenario very soon. Plus, you'll also see it in action as I play through it. I'll point to every single window around this building that we need to ensure is barricaded based on the illustration in scene number one. The second condition that has to be met at the same time as when all of those windows are barricaded is we cannot have any ghouls inside the house whatsoever. Now there's gonna be a couple other things I'm going to add into the mix here to make this particular objectives list even more entertaining. It talks specifically about barricading the windows. It doesn't necessarily say that the doors have to be closed or open in order to win. In other words, you could focus on barricading all of the windows up, but your doors can be wide open. Thematically, if you're barricading the house, everything needs to be shut, so I am not going to take a win until not only every window is barricaded, but all the doors in the house are also shut. So anyone that's straggling on the outside or just has barely enough actions to get inside but can't close the door, I'm not considering that a win. So that's just for my own enjoyment and also just to spice things up, and I have a couple other things I'm going to do to try to make this a little bit more entertaining from the very beginning with this scenario number one. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's go over the special rules for this scenario. So the first thing is all the survivors are in Romero mode to start. They're all face up right now. We knew this from setup. The second step of the special rules is state that Barbara and Ben are set in starting area number one, which is just outside the house. Again, this is going to correlate to the narrative we just read. And also we have the rest of the survivors coming up from out of the basement together in starting area number two. The house has a number of open barricade tokens, which essentially are tokens that are used for either a barricade on one side or they're open like they are right here on the other side. For the purposes of this scene, they represent open doors straddling two zones. The third special rule to note is the Winchester 94, which we dealt with during setup, which was about placing it specifically inside the building, which removed it from being part of the starting equipment. In other words, a table leg was replaced in the six items that were then randomly assigned to our characters during setup, so that step has already been taken care of. Now here's where things start getting interesting. We have trusting each other as a special rule for this scenario. It states any survivor giving the Winchester 94 starting equipment to another survivor with a reorganize or trade action may switch 
to zombicide mode. So basically, by handing off this particular rifle to any of our other survivors, the person who actually hands off the rifle in that trade action is going to be able to flip over from Romero side to zombicide mode, and that is going to inherently boost up the amount of abilities that they have to access and also give them a little bit of a boost during combat. The next special rule is all about equipment stashes that are inside the house. As you can see with Night of the Living Dead, we've got different equipment decks, which is very different than the typical Zombicide versions we've seen in the past, where usually they're just all merged into one gigantic equipment deck, and you're constantly searching through these decks, hoping to land certain items that may benefit you. Here you can be a little bit more selective with the things you're searching, which makes things quite nice in terms of giving you a leg up on finding what you actually need to accomplish a goal or whatever your strategy ends up being. In this case, for this scenario, there's two spots that are important to note. One is this zone right over here, or this room, is all about searching for melee equipment. So if you head into that room, you can search and grab a card from the red deck up at the top. Now, if you're playing the game, you might want to take the red deck and just place it in that room as a reminder. Makes it easier to remember that's where you can find that type of equipment. For the purposes of this playthrough on camera, I'm not going to muddy up the board with decks of cards, but you certainly could do that if you want to make things easier. The other place that's important to note is about ranged items. You're going to find the green deck worth of items, which is on the far left over here in this space on the stairs leading to the upstairs or second level. One thing to keep in mind though is you're only able to search those two decks if you're in zombicide mode. The next special rule is all about the corpse lady. The first time a survivor reaches the stairs zone where that ranged equipment is on tile 3R, all the survivors in zombicide mode shift back to Romero mode. A survivor standing in the zone has to spend two actions to remove the corpse and until then the zone beyond it can not be searched. The final special rule is about makeshift barricades. Because we're trying to barricade the house, there are two primary ways you can get barricade tokens into your inventory on your survivors to then be used to actually barricade the windows. The first way is all these open barricade tokens all around the house can actually be interacted with with a survivor in either of the zones that the tokens straddle. So basically, each of these tokens is straddling between two zones. If the survivor's in either one of them, they can interact with a single action to grab up all those boards. They flip it over, it becomes a barricade token that sits in their inventory and can then be used to put on one of the windows. That's one way that you can actually try and barricade up the house. The second way to find barricade tokens is to be rummaging through the house deck. That's the brown deck at the very top center of this shot. You can see it right there. We've also got barricade tokens right here that are not part of the scenario. So as I mentioned just earlier, if you go after this particular one that's inside the house and you rip these boards up, you'll flip it over, it becomes a barricade token that goes in your inventory and it's gone off the house. Whereas these ones come from the house deck directly. That's your second way of gathering up some barricades. One thing that's worth noting is you definitely can go ahead and trade these barricades between your survivors freely. You still have to use the trade action just like an equipment trade as per normal, but there's also no limit to how many you could be carrying. So a single survivor could be carrying every single barricade if you thought that was a good strategy. A survivor carrying a barricade token can spend one action to block a window in their zone. And to do it, you take a barricade token from the survivor's inventory, set it in the closed position across the window, and the survivor also immediately gains 5 XP. So not only are you moving closer towards winning, because that's the objective, is to board up the whole house, the downside is you're bumping up your XP, which is going to push the amount of zombies coming out of these spawns. And that's all you need to know special rules wise to get going with scene number one. One thing to note, this one right here, you don't have to worry about barricading that up. It even says it in the illustration for scene number one that that is ignored. It's not highlighted as one of the different areas of this house you need to have barricaded. So as I mentioned earlier on, I did sneak a house rule in there for myself, but I'm really just doing this to make things more interesting for the playthrough and to ramp up the difficulty just a little bit. And that's just because I want to actually barricade the entire house up. I want those doors to be closed as well as the windows to be barricaded all the way around. Just to let you guys know, we've got a door here. It's open currently and a door back here leading to the outside that's closed. I don't care about this door here because there's no way for zombies to break into this room. So this door 
door doesn't have to be closed for my playthrough, but I need that one to be closed. And that door situation is the only thing I'm adding into the fray that's not part of the objectives uh, for this particular scene, but it makes logical sense in my mind. You'd want to not leave the door open if you're trying to barricade a house. The second house rule that I'm going to throw into the equation here to bump the difficulty up on myself is I'm going to simply spawn zombies at every single spawn that's currently showing right now. So we got three spawn zones, one here, up there, and over here. We'll go ahead and pull cards for them we may or may not get zombies at any of them because we are still in the blue range of our xp but you never know we might have some visitors showing up a little bit earlier than would be if we were playing scene one as we should be uh, but again i'm trying to make this playthrough even more exciting and tip the odds maybe against myself just a bit so we can see if i can pull this off so we'll go ahead right now and start with the very first spawn zone pull a card and do so for each of the others whenever you spawn from spawn points in this game you always start with the white one and then move clockwise all the way around to the rest the very first one unfortunately is sitting right in the same zone as ben and barbara do they have any visitors uh we'll find out in a few seconds walkers and it looks like there will be one there they're coming for you barbara all right let's check out that north spawn point see what happens Nothing. Good. Okay, good. Relatives, that would be really bad. And we'll talk about how relatives affect the game later on. But as of right now, being that we're in the blue level of XP, nothing going on there. All right, let's find out what's happening in that last spawn location to the east. I'm hoping it's not bad. Oh no. Oh geez. Five. Oh no. I was going to say five fatties would be insane, but three fatties. That's really bad. I take it all back. I don't want to do this spawn ahead of time. Bad idea. No, too late. It's the way it is, and that's exactly what I wanted. I kind of wanted to spice this up and have a little bit more tension. I honestly was not expecting to have three fatties right off the bat. That is a little stressful. Uh, just so you guys know, in terms of who, you know, what weapons I can actually use to even take down fatties, most of you that have played Zombicide before know it, they need two damage to be taken down. And Tom has a crowbar and is currently the only individual that can potentially take down a fatty with what he currently has. Barbara is going to kick off the player's phase. She's not happy that there is a ghoul in her space. Now, I do have a tire iron with Tom. You'd think that might have better accuracy, but they actually have the same accuracy whether you're throwing that table leg around, which is what Barbara has, or the crowbar. The only major difference is the crowbar does two damage to the fatties and can take them out. So we'll just go with a table leg hit with Barbara and see how this goes. So we'll grab one die. We're looking for a four plus. It's a 50-50 roll, and we'll see how it goes goes a five barbara's done her work that zombie's been dealt with second action for barbara she is going to head inside the house barbara is now in the house and you can see here this is the table leg that i just used to take out that ghoul outside i want to show you this you can actually see that i rolled a single die i needed a four plus and it does one damage one damage is all you need to take out a regular walker and of course this is a melee action so you have to actually be in the same space down below this table leg it says if you have flammable fluid you may discard this card to get a torch once you get a torch, it doesn't sound like much in most other Zombicide games at all, but a torch is huge in Night of the Living Dead. So I'm going to go ahead and draw from the house deck by searching this area. And when I do this for my third and final action with Barbara, I'm just going to that brown mini card deck, grabbing the top card off and seeing what we get. Ah, didn't get exactly what I wanted at this moment. I got plenty of shells. It says you may reroll once all attacks with the shotgun weapons. The new result replaces the previous one, and this card may be used in the backpack. Plenty of shells is in her backpack. I'm just using that token you can see on her character board. The little skull, that's just going to denote and help me to remember which survivors I've already activated. So Barbara's done. I can move on to the next survivor. Next, I'm going to activate Ben. He is definitely going to duck into the house and close the front door behind him. Sealing off an entry point for that ghoul spawn that's just outside the door sounds like a good idea. He's got one more action left, but one thing I want to mention is when I was talking about Ben and Barbara out here taking on that one ghoul, I mentioned that Ben actually had the crowbar, I believe, and that was a mistake. Ben has the claw hammer, but there's no difference between the claw hammer and the table leg for its face values in terms of the stats. So either way, I could have gone with any 
character there to take that walker out. So there's no gameplay impact there, but just wanted to mention that Tom is the one with the crowbar and Tom is blue right here. And for my last action with Ben, I'm gonna go ahead and search the house deck and hope to find something useful. Let's go ahead and draw a card off the top, see how it goes. Hey, we got ourselves some boards. I was talking about this earlier, just before we started playing. So when you get this card, you can discard it to gain three XP right away, but you can also place this in your backpack if you don't want to do that at the moment you receive it. So Ben's got the boards card in his backpack. He's also gone ahead and spent all three of his actions. Barbara has also been activated and complete, also has the one XP from the walker she took down. Next to activate is one of the individuals coming up from the basement. Next survivor I'm gonna activate is Judy, and Judy is going to unlock the basement door so we can get our group out of here. Judy is in yellow, so she'll open this up. She's gonna move into this main area here. I was tempted to get her into either here or here. Here if I wanted to go for melee weapons, or here if I wanted to wait to try and hopefully search for something to help with the fatties that are eventually gonna come through to fight them. But I might just move her here and search to hope that she gets something in the house that's gonna help her out. So we'll move her to here and grab a card from the house deck and see if it pans out. So Judy found plenty of bullets. So we already have a plenty of shells card on Barbara and it looks like she's gonna be ready to go with ammo in the future. We'll definitely place this in her backpack. It's gonna allow her to do some re-rolls. Next up, I'm gonna activate Helen. Helen is orange. She's gonna come out of the basement into this main room here. She's first gonna go ahead and grab this wood so she can create a barricade. I'll flip this over. It'll be a barricade token that will sit in her inventory. We can use it later. And then she's going to search the house deck in this room. Not bad, not bad at all. Not only did she end up scraping up enough wood to make a barricade token, she's got a boards token that she found in this place too. So she is definitely ready to board some stuff up, but I was really hoping to find something that's going to help us have a little bit easier of time with the fatties that are coming in the future. Next survivor to activate is going to be Harry. Harry's in green. He is going to move into the main room with everybody else and search as well. Harry found a scope in this room. It says discard along with a Winchester 94. The survivor receives a scoped Winchester, may be used in the backpack. So I can definitely place that scope in the backpack. It's cool because the Winchester's in here. The downside is, Again, as I mentioned earlier, fatties are going to be all over that room real soon. With my last action for Harry, I'm actually going to move him from where he currently sits into this room over here to eventually kind of be there and just waiting, hopefully for his opportunity to get over the Winchester, but also kind of guarding this window right next to a spawn point. And last but certainly not least, we have Tom, the only individual that can actually kill fatties. The downside is with three of them in the same space, it's almost suicide. Well, not necessarily complete suicide, but if we want Tom to get really hurt uh, based on the odds, we may or may not be able to swing killing one, maybe two of them. If I happen to get all three in, uh, in one big old flow of kills, that would be incredible. Chances of that happening are pretty slim, so he'd probably take a couple points of damage while he's trying to take those fatties down. So for now, I'm actually going to keep Tom out of the action, and we're going to hope that we can find something nearby. Uh, we may need to kind of keep ourselves together and maybe have the fatties split up, and when they start splitting up, maybe Tom can then start taking them out. So what I'll do is have Tom leave the basement area, use one action to get into this room. He'll search to see if he finds something useful, and then we'll kind of make a choice. He'll likely stay in the same place. Maybe he'll just end up barricading a window here to kind of block up against anything nasty happening here. It's worth noting that this is a zone right here with the spawn token, and this is a separate zone right here. So Tom didn't find exactly what he wanted, but he did find a flashlight. It says search, draw two cards, and maybe use in the backpack. So this is going to make his searches in the future even more efficient. I think for Tom's last action it makes sense to go ahead and spend an action and grab this and turn it into a barricade token for him. And that's gonna do it. We can now move into the ghouls phase. In the ghouls phase it's really straightforward. You're going to have each ghoul spending a single action to do one of these things. The first thing you check is ghouls in the same zone as at least one survivor are gonna straight up attack them. In this case we have three fatties. They're considered ghouls. There's no survivors in their space, so that's not happening. We move to the next one. 
Breaker Ghouls, and Breaker Ghouls are their own specific mini we haven't seen yet, so they're not going to apply here, but I'll mention it how they work anyway. They're going to go ahead, and if they didn't attack a survivor, they're instead going to attack barricades and doors, and they're literally going to open every single closed barricade and closed door in their zone, meaning if they're in a zone where there happens to be a door and a window and maybe another window, all those things are being ripped down. And finally, all ghouls who didn't attack will move instead. So that's gonna to apply to the fatties here because they weren't able to attack. And guess where they're coming? Well, in this particular case, they actually are outside they don't have any line of sight to any of the survivors, as when you're outside looking into a building, the actual ghouls themselves can only see one space into a building, just like the survivors can only see one space outside of the building when looking out. Uh, thankfully, in this scenario, that works perfectly because we can technically see out the window and see pretty much anything right in front of the window. But there'll be other scenes or scenarios where there's a lot more uh, in terms of what's going on outside, and you you won't be able to see everything. There's different uh, blockages on line of sight. So how do the fatties decide where to go when they can't actually draw line of sight to any survivors? Well, if they can't draw any line of sight because they're not invisible, then they're going to select the zone with the most survivors. And I've purposely done this so that I'm gonna bring the zombies into the house and then at the next point, if I can keep my group relatively together, I'm gonna be able to have those fatties split up. And my hope is by splitting Splitting them up in the house, I'll be able to either play cat and mouse with a few of them while Tom runs around trying to thwack them all out before we actually get destroyed. Because at this point in time, Tom's the only one that can do any damage to these things. So what we're going to do... The fatties are obviously going to come through the window because they're coming towards taking the shortest path to where that target zone is. The target zone being where all my survivors currently are. That's going to bring them right inside the house because there's nothing stopping them from coming in. So you can see just how important barricades are because if I had a barricade up on that window, there would be no way for those fatties to get through until a breaker actually makes its way through and destroys that barricade. So it really can buy you quite some time. Plus, of course, we're trying to actually accomplish barricading the house as an objective overall anyway. The thing is, no matter how I diced it up actions-wise in the first round, there was no way I was going to be able to get to that window and barricade it no matter what I did. Right after we activate all the ghouls, now we're going to go ahead and spawn some more. Here we go. We're going to start with the white spawn right here. We'll flip over the top card. We got barricade and door opening. That's really bad. So again, nothing here is going to happen because we're in blue. We also don't have any breakers. But if we happen to have any breakers on the map and we happen to have anything that was boarded up, uh, whether it be barricades or doors, those things would all be considered open at this point. Uh, so that's a good card to burn right now. Uh, it means there's also nothing happening right here. So we're relatively safe in this area as well, which is good. Uh, now, the other thing to note here is even though I've closed the door, I haven't fully secured the zone that's right here uh, because there is technically a window right here too that they can just waltz right in. So again, another reason why I was collecting boards like a crazy person in this spot because I'm hoping to board that room up before we leave to try to deal with the fatties or we might cower there in fear for another turn based on uh, the fact we just got that spawn card that cleared it up. Next one up top to the north is going to be breakers. Well, there you go. Speak about the breakers, they show up. Um, so we got one of them because we're in blue that's going to show up in the north side. So we have Harry up there. He is able to technically take care of that breaker, which is a good idea because there's no point in barricading it and then having the breaker just bust through it later. Probably should step outside and deal with it. That's likely what he will do. And then on the far east side, where we have the most action with all the fatties, hopefully nothing more is coming. Oh, no, there's a ton. Three walkers are coming to that side. So it looks like the Winchester is going to become even more difficult to grab early on. All right, well, this is getting a little heated pretty quick. And this is, again, one of the reasons why I thought it'd be fun to kind of get that extra spawn in there at the beginning, just to kind of spice up the playthrough and put me in a little bit of a crunch from the beginning and not give me that, uh, you know, room to breathe and run around the house as if I have a full turn to just do what I want. This is going to put some stress on me to actually try and weigh a bunch of different strategic options as to how I'm going to deal with not only zombies in the house, but the ones that are probably coming in a 
little bit later. Starting off the round for the survivors, I'm gonna go ahead and have Harry actually run a room over close to the fatties from where he is into here just to grab these boards. And then he's going to hightail it back to this space. I'm actually not gonna bother going outside and trying to attack a breaker because if I move out and attack, even if I was successful, I can get back in. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is I jump out the window, I miss the attack, then I need to get the other attack to land in order to avoid a possible hit in the future. And even if I land it, I'm just stuck in a spawn zone that could potentially dump all kinds more zombies and I could have Harry in a bad situation. So I'd rather have this single zombie come to me and then have three actions to try to get rid of it versus the other way around. The other strategy there is that Harry being where he's situated right now, if he can run over, which he can, and grab this wood and run back, currently when enemies are inside of a house like this, they can only see one room over in terms of their line of sight. So they cannot see Harry here. So when they actually decide what they're gonna do movement wise, they're still gonna focus on the room with the most survivors when they can't see anybody by line of sight, which means they will split, which is exactly what I want them to do so that I can go after them with a crowbar. As you can now see on the very far right hand side of the screen, Harry now has a barricade token right over here sitting next to his board, which I'll definitely be using later on. And he's run in, grab that one, as I mentioned, come back out here, is waiting for the breaker to come in. That's all three actions for him. And we'll go ahead and focus on our next survivor. I'm gonna go ahead and activate Helen next. And Helen's in orange here. She has a boards card that I gained prior. I'm gonna go ahead and discard this card to gain three XP on her. And then she's gonna gain an additional uh, barricade token. She already has one right here, so she'll have two available in future use. Now she's gone up three XP and that's okay. We're still in blue. Another thing to think about is every time I barricade up a window, even though it's very tempting for Helen to do this right now, I get five XP for that, which means it would push Helen into the yellow and nobody's really ready to get up to that yellow space just yet. Only a handful of our people have uh, barricades that could give them five XP, but that would still not be enough because you need to have seven XP to crest over to yellow to take advantage of the skills that come with it. So it's probably not a good idea to have Helen going crazy and putting up two barricades right away and just pushing everybody and all the zombies up on the scale when we're already trying to deal with what's going on here. Let's keep it blue for as long as we can. Uh, so what I'm going to do is in this point, search in the room in the house deck and hope to find something useful. All right, so we didn't find anything useful at all, but it appears that Helen was literally looking in the perfect direction, staring right over here at the sofa where nobody seemed to check in the last round when everyone was searching in here vigorously trying to find something good. No one noticed that there was a an individual named Karen here in the corner, and that individual is no longer with us, but has now turned into a ghoul. And this is a red miniature that shows up when this card is pulled from the house deck. So we can now go ahead and discard this card. Now, if a relative shows up when people are in a uh, zombicide mode, this is where a relative has major impacts on what's going on because you are forced to immediately flip over people that are in zombicide mode to Romero mode, which of course, if you have progressed down the XP track some ways and you've unlocked skills, just like all we, we most of us are familiar with zombicide in terms of the number of skills you eventually accumulate as you play the game. Flipping back to Romero mode essentially cuts you right down from maybe having three, four, five skills available to having like one or two. And of course they're not as good. So there is a big time impact to a relative showing up in your space. There's an emotional impact on the characters that see that relative coming back to life. It takes you from being in your buffed up zombicide mode where you want to take out everything that's walking to maybe a more uh, saddened uh, state where you're seeing something that you actually loved who's no longer with you and now wants to try to kill you. It's a little bit, it messes with your head. Uh, so basically in this case, we're safe because everyone's in Romero mode, so this relative's not gonna affect us, and the effects of it have, you're gonna do nothing. Really, the only thing that happens here is that the relative is basically considered like any other ghoul. It'll take a single damage to get rid of it, and that's just about it. But if we had had anyone in zombicide mode, instant impact would have happened. Now at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like Helen cares too much about relatives in general and has a table leg and one more action to spend. So Helen is going to whip that table leg straight at the relative and try to see if we can take it out. We're looking for a four or higher. 
Oh, a six will do. So Helen goes up another XP. So in total for her whole turn, she's gone up four XP. She's still in the blue though, which is good. Next up, I'm gonna go ahead and activate Judy. Judy is in a room with a whole bunch of people. She is yellow. She's gonna go ahead and search that room and hope to find something useful as well. Awesome, Judy ended up finding some boards in this room, so we'll definitely place that in her backpack. Now, in order to make Harry more useful later on, he's got the scope, and eventually I'm hoping to see Harry actually carrying the Winchester, at least initially. I might go ahead and give Harry the Plenty of Bullets card at this point. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually have Judy move from where she currently is into this room, and then she is going to hand over the Plenty of Bullets card that she received and trade it over to Harry. So Judy's turn is complete. Let's move to Tom, because Tom has that flashlight that he picked up earlier, and I'm a little scared because if he happens to do a search, pull something nasty, and we run out of other people to help with any kind of problems, well, we'll have a problem. So let's have Tom do his search. We'll activate him next. He is blue. He's gonna do his search at the house deck, two cards pulled. So while Tom was lurking around in the room trying to find something, he ended up finding a scope, but at the same time, he somehow disturbed the individual or the relative we thought we killed, and it's back again. So we're gonna go ahead and put the relative back in the room again in terms of its effects. Nobody in zombicide mode at this point, but we do have to kill the thing off to avoid getting hurt by it. And I'm definitely gonna grab that scope for Tom. Just when you think the relative is dead, it is not. We still have two actions with Tom. I'm gonna to use a crowbar right now. The crowbar has a one die, four plus, and will do two damage, which is way more than enough. Let's see if we can pull this off. First attack is actually a miss. Wow, Tom is not pulling his weight at this point in time. Let's see with the third action if I can take out the relative. No, it's a two, it just rolled off screen. So actually going ahead and activating Tom early was smart because even though he's got that flashlight, it gets a little dangerous. Next up, we're gonna activate Ben. He kind of steps in front of Tom and says, well, let me show you how it's actually done. We'll go ahead and roll for the claw hammer. Looking for a four or higher. Oh my gosh, my whole crew is just falling apart. So the relative's messing with them this time around. Let's see if we can do it. There we go, finally taking it out on the second action. So Ben has gone up in XP for taking out the relative, has one more action remaining, and is likely going to go ahead and search, although it's a little bit sketchy because I don't know if he really wants to see anything else pop up. That's gonna come in handy for sure. The flashlight is something that Ben gladly will pick up that is going to help him in the future. Last but certainly not least is Barbara, and I have a plan of action for her. Again, I wanna get her a better weapon as well. We're gonna go ahead and have her run into the hallway area from here. She's red, running through this doorway into here with one move action, she'll be in this area, which allows her to interact with this, which is a door token for all intents and purposes of the scene, as well as other scenes as well. So we're gonna go ahead and try to open that, which is simply just using another action. And then we're gonna run out of there and back to this main room to hopefully make our plan work and it will because if we have as many survivors as we have over here those fatties are going to split because they can't see anybody and we're going to be able to pick one of them off making life easier to go after two in the future. So Barbara did her job. She ran down the hallway here. She interacted with this token right here, which essentially just flipped it to allow us to eventually get into this space right here to search for ranged weapons. But before she moved in there, she decided to run back to get back in here with the most survivors and stay kind of close to home with everybody. The other thing I want to mention is when we eventually get a survivor to move into the hallway and then up the staircase to this zone right here, when that happens, the second the survivor moves into the staircase, which hasn't happened yet, uh, at that point, anyone that's in zombicide mode has to revert to Romero mode because there is a corpse lady there, which is obviously gonna affect everybody, and the person that actually moved into that space would then need, or someone inside that space, on the staircase right here. We need to spend two actions to get rid of or deal with that corpse lady there. And then from that point on, we can start rummaging around in the upstairs area trying to find weapons to help us. All right, so now we're moving into the ghouls phase. We're gonna start with the breaker up north here. So first off, this breaker can attack anyone in his space. It also, next, can't break any barricades or doors in his space. So the last thing it can do is move and it definitely can see the survivors one space 
into this building, so it's going to hop right through the window at us. Next up are the fatties, and I've set this up so that they are going to split. So the first thing they'll do is, can they tack you in their space? Nope. There's nothing to do with breakers when you're talking about fatties, and the last thing is they're going to move. Well, can they see anybody? So right now, being in an interior space, they're looking in spaces adjacent to them. Nothing in any of those spaces in terms of survivors. The next thing they're going to do is find the space or the zone with the most survivors. So that's going to be this one right here. Then they need to draw the shortest route to get there and then figure out which one of those paths they're taking. If there's only one route, that's the easy route. You do it. If there's more than one route, you get to split. So in this case, fatties are moving, technically could move one, two to get to this room or one, two to get to this room. So because of that, they're going to split, which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so we're gonna bring two of the fatties on purpose along this path. So two of them are gonna come into the hallway and only one is gonna come down here. And the reason I'm doing that is I want to put the one down in the kitchen because that's where we can search for melee weapons. We definitely can wipe out the one, get some people into that area, hopefully find some melee weapons that are strong enough to help us take out the other two. But also, if that doesn't work out, Tom should be able to handle two fatties versus three and have a little bit better odds in not taking a wound. Last but not least, we have the walkers and we're gonna use the exact same logic we just applied. Can't tack in this space, can't see any survivors currently, so they're moving towards the, or the zone with the most survivors. That's obviously gonna have them come piling through the window. And that's gonna do it. So we got all the zombies in the house now and we still have to spawn. That's right, it's not over just yet. So the first card off the top deck's going to the white spawn right here. Let's hope for nothing. Oh, nice. We got it. Relative. Sweet. So nothing going on that side of the board. That's good. We've gotten super lucky there. Another breaker showing up to the north. Those breakers love the bricks up there. Um, and then, of course, we got the east side of things. Another bro Ooh, a breaker on that side too. Okay, that's not so bad. I'm happy not to see any more fatties for a bit. All right, we're ready to go now with the survivor's turn. We have to decide who's gonna go first. As you can see, things are getting pretty intense all the way around, but this is great because now we can start being aggressive and try to clear out as many of these zombies as we possibly can in this coming round. The first survivor I'm gonna activate is Tom with his crowbar. He is going to move from where he currently is into this room here and make a couple attacks here. And I'm hoping he only needs to make one attack and be successful right at the beginning. With Tom's crowbar, one die looking for four or higher and any hit or success will be a kill against the fatty. Here we go. Oh, just barely made it with a four. So Tom gets the kill, gets one XP for the fatty and now is tempted to go ahead and open this door in the future to allow us to get in there and do some exploring through the uh, melee deck, but we need to be in zombicide mode in order to do that search. So we haven't got the Winchester and done any trading yet to be able to flip over to our zombicide mode on any of our characters as we're all in Romero mode. So no point in doing that. Let's use Tom's flashlight for his third action in order to search twice. Now this is huge. Not only do we get boards, which we definitely need. We also got flammable fluid. It says on flammable fluid, discard along with a mason jar. The survivor receives a Molotov may it be used in the backpack. And again, what's really important to note that flammable fuel can be used in combination with a table leg in order to discard a table leg and turn it into a torch. And what's also worth noting is you don't have to discard the entire flammable fluid to light up a table table leg. You might think you have to based on many other Zombicide games, but in this one, if you're just lighting the table leg, the idea behind it is it's a full can of fluid, so you could actually use it on multiple characters. Now, as you can see, Tom is way up here and has two inventory slots full of the three in his backpack. So he technically cannot take both of the items that he just found unless he discards something. This is where things get tough. I like having that flashlight. I also like having that scope, but I'm gonna let that scope go because I know that Harry already has this same scope and I'm gunning to get him to find the Winchester and be able to combine it. So I'm okay with losing it. So we're gonna discard the scope from Tom in order to make room to put the boards and flammable fluid in his backpack. Pack. 
Overall, that was a pretty successful turn. He got in there, took out the fatty, managed to find some useful items. His turn is now done. Let's move to the next survivor. Next survivor I'm going to activate is Helen. She is orange. I'm going to have her move into the same room as Tom, do a trade action in order to grab the flammable fluid. She's then going to go ahead and use that flammable fluid to turn the table leg into a torch. Helen is now in the same room as Tom, and you can see right on the table leg itself, it states, if you have the flammable fluid, which she now does after her trade, you may discard this card to get a torch. So she's going to do that right now. Again, notice it doesn't say to then discard the flammable fluid. That's also mentioned in the rule book. You keep this card. It only uses a little bit of fluid. The only way you would actually discard the entire card here is if you use it for its bottom action here on the card itself that says to discard it along with a mason jar. And at that point, you're actually creating a full on Molotov cocktail. And just like that, we now have a torch on Helen and you can see I'm rolling two dice, three plus, and I can do two damage, which means I can start swinging at some fatties. So she still has one action left. She moved, she traded, that's two actions. She then combined items she had. The combining of the items did not cost any actions. Her last action will be to search the house in the space she's in. And this relative will not stay dead. Now I've got another strategy up my sleeve to get these fatties to split again. I'm gonna try to get everybody into the kitchen area by the end of this is gonna be the hope at the very least so that I can have them primarily focusing on splitting these fatties right here one going here and one going here if majority of the people are out of line of sight and over in the kitchen we can get them split up and make it even easier to take them down uh, but we do kind of need to get around that staircase at some point anyway uh, and we need to get that winchester hugely it's a massive thing we need to grab as fast as possible but first thing i'll do is activate judy next she's going to make an attack against the breaker right here judy is swinging the tire iron so we're looking for a four plus on this attack Oh, we just missed it. Now, this is gonna change how I wanna do things. I was hoping to be able to take that out and then use the last two actions to get Judy from this location as far away from the fatties as possible. So I think she's gonna stop attacking at this point and hightail it to the kitchen. Now, as she makes her way back in the kitchen, there still is the relative here. And as soon as you move into a space with one of the ghouls, no matter what it is, your movement immediately ends. So at this particular point, it doesn't matter because that's all she had to get in there anyway. So she's done. I'm going to have to use one of these other two characters likely to come in here and deal with the relative at the end. But we'll go ahead at this point and activate Harry, who's going to take a swing using his table leg at the breaker that Judy couldn't pull off and kill. Looking for a four plus on this. Oh, it rolled back to a three. So Harry did not make that happen. And that's okay. It's still not bad. I still have another option here. I'm going to try to attack one more time with Harry, see if we can land it. And then I got another option I can do. There we go, that's a little better. So that is going to take out the breaker and the last action that Harry's going to do is he's actually going to hop right out the window and hide over here. So he's out of line of sight of the fatties. Next up, I'm gonna activate Barbara, and Barbara is gonna run for where she currently is, one action into the room with the relative and going to swing the table leg at that relative, hoping to take it out. Here we go with the roll, let's see how it goes. A four, that is going to be a hit, so that relative is out of here, and Barbara gains another XP, bringing her up to two. Ben is going to activate next, and as you can see in the top right hand corner there, Ben has a flashlight and boards. So what I'm going to do before I search, because I can search and pull two cards from the house deck, I don't want to have to discard one because I only have one slot available. So I'm going to go ahead and actually discard my boards right now for a free action, gain three XP, and take a barricades token which will go into Ben's inventory. Ben's search has found him flammable fuel and plenty of bullets. This is going to be super useful again. Now, the really cool thing is not only being able to create those torches you saw from flammable fuel, but also the Molotovs. The Molotovs are really awesome because if you throw a Molotov at a spawn point, you are then allowed to move that spawn point anywhere else. It's almost as if you've torched that area of the board and you don't have to worry about that area having any more zombies thematically coming from that area because it's basically on fire. There's a wall of fire kind of preventing them from coming through. So then what you do is take that spawn token, move it elsewhere, which means you can control a little bit more of where the zombies are pouring out from. Last two actions for Ben, one movement from this room into this room and the final action, he's gonna go ahead and open up this searchable area over here. Eventually, once we grab the Winchester and can start trading it around, we'll get to zombicide mode and someone can start searching for some melee weapons in there. 
That's going to wrap up all the turns for the survivors. Let's go ahead with the ghouls phase. We have a breaker that's sitting right here. Again, it's going to be focused because it can't see anyone visually by drawing a straight line of sight anywhere or into a building, for instance. Can't see uh, Harry over here in the corner either, so it's going to focus on the zone with the most survivors and move the shortest distance to it. So that will have the breaker coming through the window into here. The two fatties that are sitting here are now exactly equal distance to these two different spaces to get to the most survivors as well as their outside line of sight. So they're going to split one going here and one going into this room. These walkers can plainly see all the survivors in here. They're going to come all charging in and this one breaker will pop through the window. And just like that, these zombies are starting to converge on us, but it's perfect because, again, we are now a little bit better prepared for taking out the zombies, and we're especially prepared for taking out the regular ones. So we should be able to clear the house up quite quickly here, I hope. But we still have to spawn, which means more of these things are coming. Well, they're always coming. First one starting from the white spawn zone over here is going to be one breaker popping up right here. We'll have to the north of us three fatties that's going to present a problem as well but at least now we have two individuals who can deal with it plus we have lots of flammable fluid to start passing around and getting our table legs caught on fire and then more fatties another one fatty coming over to the east of the house now it's going to be an exciting round for the survivors coming up, so let's go ahead and start it off. I'm going to go ahead and have Helen activate first in orange. She is going to move into this room and make an attack with her torch against this fatty. She gets to roll two dice looking for a three or higher. Here's hoping the dice are with us for this roll. Oh yeah, she got it. No problem whatsoever. So we got two successes in the end, but no matter what, that fatty is dead. We only needed a single success to do two damage, so that fatty is out of here. Now, if there had been two fatties in this room, she could have taken both out, which is pretty incredible. She'll gain an XP, which will bring her up to five total. Instead of searching, she's decided to head towards that hallway where we can hopefully get closer to where the ranged weapons are and dealing with the corpse that's there and all that other good stuff. Next up, we're going to go ahead and we're going to activate Harry, who's popped outside the window and likely wants to get back inside the house with his friends. He's only got a table leg and definitely needs to get that thing lit with all those fatties coming at us from the north. So he's going to have an attack action for his second action against the breaker in the room. Lead a four or higher to kill. No, that's not good. Okay, so we don't want to stick around in that room too much longer, but now he's in a little bit of trouble. I'm probably going to go ahead right now and make an attack, but this means I definitely need to get somebody else in that room who can kill fatties, so Tom is going to have to get over there to help him later on. So for now, we'll go with one more attack, see if we can take the breaker out. No, we still can't. That's not good at all. Okay, so he's going to need some help, and he's now stuck in that room. So Tom's going to activate next, going to come running to the rescue to avoid someone getting hit for damage. He's going to move one, two, and make a single attack with his crowbar, looking for a four or higher. Here's hoping this next attack lands. Oh yeah, that breaker's out of here. One more XP for Tom, bringing him up to a total of two, and he is now done his activation as well. And we definitely have some action going on in the kitchen. We need to deal with these enemies. So what I'm going to do is have Ben start flinging around his claw hammer and seeing if he can take out some of these guys. So first off, we'll go ahead with a single roll. We're going to be attacking one of the walkers here and hoping it lands. We got a three. We needed a four. So that is a miss. He's going to continue to try and swing his claw hammer and make this land. A one. That's another miss. And last but not least... A six, so one of them gets taken out. Ben's at a total of five XP, so still safe, not in the yellow yet. One more kill would still be safe. The one after that, when we get to seven, would tip him over to yellow. So it's a good thing he wasn't able to pull off all of those hits. Now we're going to be making some attacks with Barbara. So Barbara's got a table leg. She's going to get in on the action and start swinging. First roll for Barbara is going to be a... S oh, another miss. That's not good. Second one is a hit. Barbara is definitely pulling her weight here. Got an extra XP, bringing her up to three. Last attack here for her, for her final action. Ah, she wasn't able to put the final hit on the last ghoul. 
Judy is the last to activate, so she is going to run right up that last ghoul in her space and try to take it out with the tire iron. Everyone else takes a step back as Julie wields the tire iron, swinging it pretty aggressively and just missing the ghoul. We're going to go for another attack here, and we land it on the second hit. Judy gained her first point of XP. She's got one action left, and I'm going to choose to actually do nothing. I don't have any trades I need to do. I also don't want to search and risk actually pulling up a relative at the very end of the survivor's phase. So we're going to stop right here. Now we're moving into the ghouls phase. No ghouls can attack any survivors currently. We do have a breaker right here. The breaker, when it's next to any barricaded area or a door, is going to break open that door. So this is going to break open. And then over here, where the fatties are obviously can see one zone into the building. They'll jump right into the house. We have another fatty right here that can actually see this area and this area. Could go either way, but we'll always go towards the, you know, where there's more survivors. So that fatty's heading down here this breaker same idea and this fanny will come in through the window all right, so here's the lay of the land. Currently, this is going to complete part number one of Night of the Living Dead, scene number one, what's happening. Really hope you guys are enjoying the playthrough thus far, and in the next one, we're going to see how quickly we can start using these barricade tokens and board cards that we have to get more barricade tokens to do a real big job of barricading everything up, hoping the breakers don't bust through it, and trying to get rid of every single ghoul in the house at the same time. Thank you guys so much for watching, see you in the next one, and as always, keep on rolling solo!